Um, that clock in the back says 1.35, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Tom Mount. I'm a technology lead at Eastern Standard. It's a digital marketing agency in Philadelphia. Um, just wanted to go through uh, some quick introductions real quick. Um, about me, so I'm the technology lead. Um, I'm in charge of our dev team at Eastern Standard. And basically anything that comes through the development pipeline, I've got my fingerprints on at some point in the process. Um, I deal with client communications a lot. Uh, even prior to uh, signing contracts, I'm looking at RFPs, you know, doing questions for clients, uh, potential clients. Uh, just being the face of the company from a technology perspective and uh, showing them that we have solutions to their questions. Um, also, I'm a bit of a kind of a closet geek. Um, I uh, was one of those guys in high school that went through all of the math classes and still had some had a year left that I didn't have to take any math courses because I took them all. So I was that kid in high school, um, and uh, it served me well. Now uh, you know, doing a lot of uh, work with front end designs uh, kind of teaches you how to think a little bit about problems, how to solve problems. So that's uh, it's been a big help for me in my life. I'm also uh, some hobbies. My uh, degree is in music. So computers was uh, kind of a hobby for me, and I turned it into a career. Um, right now, my current musical outlet is uh, I jam on the bass with some of my friends a couple times a month. Um, fun doing that. I also play recreational football. Um, wanted to give a shout-out to my team who was playing in the championship game today without me. First time our team has ever done that. And uh, I thought that it would be better to come to Princeton instead. Um, I hear that they lost, sadly. So, um, but they said it was a good game, so I'm eager to hear the report from them. Uh, and then as far as Eastern Standard goes, um, like I said, we're based in Philadelphia, just across the river. Uh, we're a uh, marketing and technology agency. Um, we combine a lot of the branding and marketing with a very keen understanding of how technology can help our clients address their branding and marketing strategies. Uh, we're also a very collaborative organization. Uh, our development team, some of whom are here today, um, works very closely with our UX and our design team all the way through the process from the point that we get a contract signed to the point that the client has uh, delivered the final product. Uh, our team, designers, developers, UX, everybody works together at all phases of the project to make sure that everything is the way that we promised it would be when we signed the contract. And a uh, quick note, we are hiring. Um, we do have some positions open. Um, they're all listed on our website. We're looking for developers to build our team. I keep telling people I have a very nice problem of having more projects than I have developers. Uh, so we are hiring developers. We're also hiring some uh, content folks, uh, more of a junior kind of entry level role for that. Uh, so if you are freelancing, looking for your next stop, um, come and see me, stop by our table. We're right around the corner, uh, right outside these doors actually. And uh, we got somebody there all day long to answer your questions and uh, show you what we have open. So I have a question here, what do our customers need? So this session is all about social media. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Um, a lot of our customers, especially those in the higher ed space, uh, which is people that we deal with probably more than any other vertical in our industry, Increasingly, I've been looking for ways to embed social media on their websites in a very visible way. Um, and it goes beyond just putting in a simple carousel that shows the most five most recent posts from Facebook. Uh, some of them have very complicated, very design-heavy requirements. They want to be able to show multiple social media platforms. They want to actually be able to aggregate content from multiple platforms. And as I'm going throughout this, I'm going to be using platforms to talk about things like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And uh, they, so they want to have platforms, they want to have multiple, um, multiple um, providers, I'm sorry, not multiple providers, um, multiple accounts coming in on each of those platforms, uh, properties, they might prefer to them as. So they'll have multiple platforms, they'll have multiple properties on those platforms, and they want to aggregate these things in such a way that the standard paste this embed code on your front page doesn't serve their needs. But they also want to be able to do it in such a way that it doesn't bring in a lot of additional dev time. They want to be able to add new feeds or take away feeds without in including a developer in the discussion. Content managers want to be able just to do this on their own. And the, really, the big question that it came out to is how do we as developers and site builders 
give our customers the ability to quickly scale up their social media representation on their websites without going through any lengthy development cycles. So I sat down, you know, we had a lot of clients asking for this, one after the other, and I started looking at what Drupal modules might be useful for us to do this. And I found really nothing. So I decided to make my own. Now I want to give a quick demo of, uh, of one of the sites that we did for our customers. This is, uh, this is the Penn Biden Center. This is um, a University of Pennsylvania operation in Washington, DC. Uh, we recently launched their site as part of a multi-site platform that's gonna later include the rest of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the Penn Global Department. So there's another seven departments that are gonna live on this site. But right now the Biden Center is opening, I wanna say next week or the week after. And so they needed this up a little bit earlier. And one of the things they want, they have a very active Twitter account. And they wanted a way to pull in Twitter information and then display it in a very flexible way, the way they wanted it. They didn't want to have just a regular old Twitter embed feed. So you'll see on their homepage right now, this is a screenshot I took from a few days ago. Uh, they have their own media that they're posting. They retweeted other people's media. Um, and they wanted a way to include this on their, on their website. So what we did, and I understand these, these pictures here are a little small. Um, I do have a blog post on our website, easternstandard.com that has, uh, or will have uh, later today, full-size images that you can go through and look at how we built all this out. But I wanted to show you right now, this first slide here on the left is how we're allowing them to include social media on their homepage. So we're using paragraphs on this site. And we've created a paragraph called social media feed. Uh, they can pull in a view page, and that'll display all the content for whatever is on that view that they specify. On the middle, you'll show that there's a content list. This is just your regular Drupal content. You can see that uh, there are a number of Twitter items that are pulled in as Drupal content. So we're not actually doing a real-time scrape of Twitter. We're pulling in information from Twitter and storing it inside Drupal. And then the third really tall slide, which you can't see at all. Um, if you go to the website, you'll be able to see it in a larger, larger format. But uh, this is when you're actually editing the notes. These are all the fields that we include and we pull in. Um, there are fields for whatever media was attached. There are fields to show how many times this was retweeted, how many times it was favorited. Uh, there are fields to indicate the link that somebody has retweeted. Um, and one of the features that I just pulled in was the ability to actually go scrape. If you post a link to someplace, actually grab the open graph tags from that site and pull an image from that site. So that you're, if you're doing a lot of retweeting, you don't have just a blank set of like text retweets, but you actually have images from the links that are being retweeted. Oddly enough, Twitter does not include that in their feed, in their API feed. That was a pain to work around, but we got it. The module I created to do this allows us to list all of the different feeds and migrations that we're using um, for the different platforms. So you'll see right here, we've got Twitter, I've got one feed enabled. And then uh, the configuration page allows me to change things like the property name, uh, how many tweets I want to pull at one shot. Uh, API keys, um, whether or not to publish those on import. So some Twitter specific options for this thing. And all that ties in together to display these components on the front end. And our, our site building team built out a rather clever way of uh, assembling all of that. And, uh, but that's not part of this module, so I didn't want to include it in this talk. And I chose to build this module on top of the Migrate API. And that's really what I want to talk about today in this session, is what is the Migrate API? So the Migrate API is basically Drupal's version of what we call an ETL pipeline. It is a way to bring in data, uh, mix it up a little bit, do some modifications on it, or use that data to modify something else, and then store the results of that modification in the system for use later. So I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about ETL. If you've, anybody ever worked in like data processing or big data pipeline kind of things. This is something that is done every day in those operations. Um, you can Google up a little bit more, read more about what the pipeline is, but uh, this is Drupal's version of ETL. And I have to point out this is a very synchronous process as well. Um, this happens one stage after another. So the ETL is extract, transform, and load. The extract portion happens first, and nothing else happens until that finishes. Then there's a the transform portion where you're manipulating the data, and then when that's done, and only after that's done, does the loading portion happen, and that's a little misnamed. It's actually loading into Drupal, so it's a saving process. Um, and it's also not real time. The way we have this set up, it operates on the cron. 
and is run every one to three hours, depending on how the site's configured to run cron. I also put in the option to run it manually at any point. Um, that has been a, a request from some people, like, what if we have breaking tweets that we want to show on our homepage? So there's an option to go into that configuration screen and actually run the migration manually, whenever you'd like. But it is not real time, so that is not what this module does. But we do get some benefits because all of this information is cached for use later. So that you're not actually pulling tweets every time somebody loads the page. This is kind of my working definition that I want to go off of. The Migrate API provides a way of importing structured data from some source, it processes it, and then it saves it somewhere else. That is what the Migrate API does at its core. So the API uses a little bit different terminology than your standard ETL pipeline does. So when we say ETL, we're talking about extract, transform, and load. The Migrate API uses the terms source, process, and destination when it's talking about this. And each of these terms, the source, process, and destination, matches a phase of the Migrate API's operation, matches a plugin. So this pipeline then, you know, we're, we're using Drupal 8, we've got Symfony, we have these plugins that we can write that hook into the Migrate API and allow us to do a lot of different things, um, specify different kinds of sources, specify how data should be processed, and specify different kinds of destinations. And all these things are configurable within the, within the migration configuration. So when we talk about the, uh, the core Migrate API, the Migrate API is actually part of Drupal 8. There was a plugin uh, module for Drupal 7, um, but the 8 version now has kind of been streamed into core, and it's all run on YAML configuration files. So if you're familiar with using the uh, Drush config import and config export, that is, if you're using just the Migrate API by itself, that is where you're kind of stuck using. Um, so let's look at the core source plugins, and again, these are just the plugins that are available to you for the, in the core. There's only one, and it's the embedded data source. This is not particularly useful on its own if you're trying to pull somebody else's data. It is, however, very useful in unit testing. So if you have a migration that's, that you want to test somehow, the embedded data plugin, the embedded data source, uh, allows you to actually store this information right in the YAML config file itself. So you just provide a structured list of, it's basically an array of data that you're using as you're going through and uh, this array of data we processed in the next phase of the pipeline. But that's really it. There's not really much available to you. Um, there is one other one that you can kind of roll your own plugin if you want to get into that. Um, you can actually pull information directly out of SQL. Uh, but there's nothing built up around that. And I think the reason for that is that there's a lot of different use cases, a lot of different configurations that you would need to use for this. And there's no real one-size-fits-all. So I think that they probably don't include any really complicated database sources because everybody's use case is going to be different. There's not a whole lot of standardization you can do. However, the Drupal Migrate API page on Drupal.org, which I've linked to uh, at the end of this deck, does have a, uh, an example module if you want to follow along and take a look at how to write your own database import migration. Um, Again, how useful is that? I've not ever actually used it. Um, but I think that with the, the point of the Migrate API originally being the possibility of just migrating Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 or Drupal 8 to Drupal 8, um, I think a lot of people expected that most of the writing for this would be done custom anyway because you have different fields and different content types. And there's really no, no good way of doing that in a configurable fashion. So. That guy kind of, kind of left out a little bit. So we really don't have a whole lot of options in core, just on the module by itself, as far as source. Uh, we do have some process plugins. We have a lot of process plugins. This is the meat and potatoes of where the actual pipeline works. So we have concat. We allow our concatenation of strings. We have a default value that lets you just input static text um, in, your, in your migration definition. We have a means of looking up entities um, and returning that entity ID so that you can reference taxonomies or nodes or users, whatever kind of entity. Remember in Drupal 8, everything's an entity, basically. Anything that's an entity, you can reference inside your migration. 
Uh, we have a way of formatting dates using Drupal's date time plus, which is just some Chrome built around Drupal's date time, uh, PHP's date time class. Um, one of the things that I've used that's pretty great for transforming bad incoming data is, uh, is the static map. You can specify, if I get this value, return this value, and just specify an array of keys and values to transform your data as it comes in. Another one that's great is uh, the subprocess or iterator plugin. This lets you specify a new pipeline for embedded um, complex data. So if you have an array that contains arrays of data, you can actually go through and fill out, take action on different keys and process different keys differently. You can take um, a URL field, for example, and split it into use one piece of data for the URL and use a different piece of data for the title um, that's associated with that URL. So there's a lot of different things you can do with subprocess and iterator. Um, the plugin itself for that one is actually very small. Uh, it just basically runs a, a callback that you define, but it's, it's a really powerful way of mixing up your data. And one important thing to note about this is that you don't have to do just one thing. Uh, a lot of these plugins, not all of them, but a lot of these plugins are uh, chainable. So you can take, you can specify an array of plugins to run and they'll run in order uh, so you can process some data and then use the output of that process to do something else. Uh, you can store that data or you can use it in a lookup. So you can take, a, for instance, a static map of machine names of taxonomy IDs and return human readable names. And then you can use that to look up those human readable names uh, in your new system if the, if the machine names are coming from the old system that you're trying to migrate from. So you can stack these on top of each other and achieve some really complicated behavior. And I will say, I got a little footnote down here. There are a ton more of other plugins. That's probably less than a quarter of the process plugins that are available out of the box with Drupal. Um, the Migrate API docs has a list of process plugins that is far more than this. There's some that do really simple things. There's like a, uh, a string replace one in there. And there's ones that do far more complicated things that would take me half an hour just to explain alone. So I'm going to leave those out. Um, if you're interested in more information, go to the API page. Take a look at their list of core process plugins, and uh, you know, that'll probably be a couple hours of reading time. It's pretty cool stuff. And the last part is we have our destination plugins. And again, there's not many here, but you don't need many. Um, there is one that I've never used called config. Um, it allows you to basically transfer some of this data into new config files. Um, the one that I use most often is entity. Uh, you can store data that's being processed and transformed into entities of any kind. Just a quick example, I had uh, just last week a site, somebody gave me a list of 25 users and said, we need to add these content editors like in an hour. And I was super busy and I didn't really have an hour to sit there and click add user 25 different times. So I came up with a migration that would allow me to specify names and email addresses and the role that I wanted for all those users. I used the embedded source data as my source, I just specified it right in my YAML file. In my process, I basically just said user name is this, user email is this, and then in my destination, I said it's my entity user. And then I ran the migration. 25 users imported, click of a button. Pretty great, pretty powerful operation. That's a throwaway script. It took me five minutes to write it, 30 seconds to run it. And actually, just the other day, somebody said, cool, we need these users in the next environment, too. Can you put them in test? So I'm like, let me just copy my config file into test and run it again. It's great. Um, so that's the kind of power that you have with the entity storage, is the ability to create new entities based on whatever data you're pulling in with the API. So I guess now we have to ask the question, what can we do with what we have? Right? So let's, let's just recap. We can specify structured data manually. It's got to be in YAML format. So you got to understand YAML or just honestly do what I do. And if you have JSON or something like that, plug it into a free online converter. They're really OK. Find, find one, a JSON to YAML converter, probably the first thing that comes up in Google when you search that. And there's your YAML. Um, you can pull in SQL data if you have time to write your own custom plugin. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. We can manipulate that data in a bunch of different ways. And then we can store that in nodes or entities of, of some type. So that's useful, right? I mean, I gave you a, a couple use cases. You can migrate your Drupal instance from one to another. You can quickly pull in a bunch of users. But 
there's things that I would really like to be able to do knowing what this API is capable of, right? I'd love to be able to grab XML or JSON, right? I don't want to have to keep working in YAML because that's annoying to have to keep track of all my spaces and indentations. It would be fantastic if I didn't have to specify that in my config file. Like, I'd love to be able to pull that from somewhere else. And then, oh, I don't know. Maybe we could, as we're pulling it from somewhere else, we could talk about OAuth 2 workflows and logging into the sources. We could get complex data, like what comes from an API, like, I don't know, Facebook maybe. Manipulate that data, store that data somewhere. You see where I'm going with this? So in order to do that, we got to extend the Migrate API. And there's a great plugin that I use now that is basically my default installation list. It's called Migrate Plus. Right now it's in beta. Uh, it's like 4x beta 2, I think it is, last I checked. And this is nothing more than a collection of plugins for the Migrate API. Pretty fantastic. We got source plugins, right? So now the Migrate Plus gives us a source plugin called URL. This hooks into Drupal's default Guzzle instance and allows you to use the URL as a data source. They also built on top of this some pretty cool things where you can use file colon or HTTP colon, basically the different um, ways of pulling in data that PHP knows of, like a, whatever kind of URI resource you want. File and HTTP now you can use as data, um, which means that if you have something stored in like sites all files private, you can totally just go in and do file colon that, and it'll pull that data. Um, it gives us the option to hook into Drupal's built-in JSON, XML, and SOAP parsers. Um, this is pretty great because, let's face it, most of the structured data that we're pulling is not going to be in YAML. Uh, it also gives us a couple different ways of using HTTP authentication. Basic, digest, OAuth2. Um, this is... Uh, this basically takes care of just about anything that I can think of where you would need to pull data from some other source. Um, and that's really the meat and, meat and potatoes of Migrate Plus is what it gives you inside the URL. It does give you a few process plugins. There's an entity lookup and an entity generate. Uh, if you're pulling in, I do this all the time. If I'm pulling in things that I know are taxonomy terms but I don't know if they actually exist, I can create them on the fly. Give it a vocabulary, give it a bundle name, and say, I want to create whatever you see in this list, either find it or create it if it doesn't exist. Um, I can merge a couple things into once. I can do a string replacement. I can skip if I find a value in a field. I can just skip that row entirely. Uh, as far as the destination goes, this gives us table. This is pretty powerful. I wouldn't really recommend you use it much unless you know what you're doing because Drupal tends to like data stored in its own schema. Um, but if you want to store data just freeform inside your Drupal database in a completely separate table or no, I'm, I, I would not recommend storing it inside an entity table and just like manually stuffing that information. There's a lot of like hooks and things that those entities have to have in order to be useful. But if you want to store data inside a regular old table, you can now do that with, uh, with, this, with this plugin. There's also two cool things that make this module kind of worth its weight in gold. Um, first thing we have is that migrations are now treated as entities. So you can export and import those migrations as config items, version them in your uh, VCS. You can do whatever you need to do. Um, and also we have migration groups. Now, I love abstracting things. I'm a developer at heart. I, anytime I can take code that is repeated and make it not repeated, I will take that option. So Migrate Plus allows you to create something called a migration group. So for instance, if I have a migration group of Facebook configuration. This is all configuration that would be repeated in literally every single Facebook import that I had that now lives in one place. So if I ever want to update this file and add something new to the Facebook importer or change how something's operating, I only have to change it once in my group and it's done. And the cool thing is too, these configurations can be overridden in individual ones. So I could set a default for everything to be published, let's say, every import incoming node to be published, and then override it in one specific one. Say, hey, when I import this Facebook feed, I don't want everything published. I want to manually curate this. I can do that by overriding the config that's stored in the shared config. So between the source plugins and the ability to treat everything as entities and uh, breaking out those configurations between groups and individual migrations, fantastic plugin. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's worth its weight in gold. It is the single most used plugin that I have right now. And because all these things are plugins, we're not writing significant amount of new code. 
Um, I've actually created two new process plugins myself for this module that I created. The first one's called Coalesce. Does anybody here remember the old Coalesce operator in SQL? Okay, we got a, we got a few SQL guys in here. Um, for some reason, and I know maybe it seems a little bit dirty, but being able just to say, here's a list of three things, give me the first one that's not null, it's fantastic. Especially when you get into things like, uh, which API is it? It's uh, Facebook's. So when you ask Facebook for its data, it'll give you a different set of responses depending on whether the thing you're pulling in is a story or a link that was shared. So sometimes things won't even exist in the response data if you ask for that field and it doesn't apply to that content type. So what I can do is I can say, look, like I just want something that resembles a title. So give me the text of the post, give me the message that it came in, give me, give me something, give me the description. And I can specify those three fields and use the coalesce and it'll say, is this null? Cool. Is this empty? Yep. Oh, good. We, got, we have a value. Let's use that value. It'll return that value. I um, also did a permalink Twitter. And I, I feel a little bit bad about this one. But Twitter does not actually give you a permalink to posts, uh, to tweets in their API. You've got to make it yourself. And I got tired of doing that in code, so I just wrote a quick plugin that would do it for me. Um, basically, you just pass in a property name, and you pass in an ID, and it concatenates the two and spits it out. Really su super simple, but saves me a little bit of time. So we've been talking about this in terms of what I can do with the Migrate API as it relates to social media data. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, importing some Facebook content here. This is a bit like going through a fire hose. Uh, what you're about to see now is probably six months worth of work of polishing the workflow and getting it all down to an exact science, realizing everything that I could do every single time and kind of listing those steps out. So as we're importing these things, probably the first thing that we want to do is create a content type within Drupal to hold all of the information that we're pulling in. And then I'm going to configure my migration to act on Facebook's data and store all that data. So I'm going to configure a source, right? Because that's where this whole thing starts. So I know because I'm looking through Facebook's developer documentation that they use an OAuth2 workflow, which is, uh, in a nutshell, you have to make one call to grab a token, and then you have to use that token the next time you make a call to actually get the data. Um, it's pretty secure, but it does add an extra layer, an extra level of steps. Thankfully, with the Migrate Plus, we have an OAuth2 plugin that we can use and don't have to worry about that ourselves. So I say with my OAuth2 plugin, I configure things like my primary source for the graph API, right? It's always going to be graph.facebook.com slash API slash V, whatever it is. Um, I then configure my OAuth2 plugin, and I say, here's the API key and the secret from my Facebook developer application that I created. Um, hint, do not commit those to source. Just throwing that out there. I would be remiss if I start talking about API keys and don't warn you not to store those. Um, so the plugin itself handles going and getting the token and then applying that to the call that comes back the next time around. Next thing I do in my source, I'm going to list all the fields that are present in the API that I want to keep track of. Uh, the next thing I got to do is find an ID field. Thankfully, Facebook includes their ID with every single post. That's the Facebook ID. So I just tell the Migrate API, in the data feed, this field is the API. This is the unique field. And what this does is um, I just kind of have a throwaway line that says it assists in caching. Really, on the back end, what it does is it stores a list of everything that's been imported by the Migrate API um, based on the ID that you tell it to use in this migration file. And then when I go back, the first time I import all the content, it's going to import everything. The next time I run that import, it's going to go fetch the list of things from Facebook, and it's going to run through the IDs that it found in that import, and it's going to say, have I already done anything with this ID? If yes, skip to the next one. So you're not importing content fresh every single time, unless you wanted to. There is an option in there to update or um, replace old content, but most of the time, because honestly you post something to Facebook, you're probably not going to change it that often. So most of the time all we have is just running it in, grabbing the first 10 posts, and maybe the next time it runs there's one more post that it has to import, but it doesn't go through the other 10. So configuring an ID is pretty important to make sure that that process works correctly. Um, so we configured our source, we got to configure our process plugin now. Uh, this is where we specify all the field names within the content type that we created and what values we want to assign to those fields. Um, 
this is where the plugins come in, because you know the title field in Drupal, you can only have 255 characters. But maybe somebody wrote a five paragraph long Facebook post. This is not gonna fit in a title field. It's gonna throw an error, you process a break, bad times. So we use a, uh, we use a plugin to strip down that title to just the first 255 characters. Um, the dates that, that come in from like the date that this was posted or the date that it was updated are in wildly different formats from every single provider. So we got to normalize that into a way that Drupal can understand. So there's a process in there to convert dates from some arbitrary text string and you give it the, the date format in text that you want and then just convert it into like a Unix timestamp um, and it'll return the timestamp of that date. Uh, we can add URLs and titles to our URLs. We can add image URLs. Um, we can use the default value plugin to specify the kind of node that we're going to be importing into or any other static data that we want. Uh, and then the very last step is to set our destination. Say that we're going to a node type in this case. Uh, and then everything should import. So this is, and again, this image is full size um, on the blog. This is actually a, um, an image from my code editor about the part of the group that we talked about. So we see that shared configuration portion. If we go down, you'll see it has source. And then we got our URL plugin. This is where we specify our OAuth2 stuff. We tell it to use the graph API. Um, we tell it that we're parsing JSON in this case. Um, I, hid the fields and IDs because that's just a massive amount of data. And then here's where we have our plugin pipeline, right? So for the title, this is where I said like sometimes Facebook doesn't always return the same data. Um, the data that I'm looking for for the title might be a message or it might be a description. There's really no way to tell. So I just say give me whatever one of these first has data. Um, I can also specify a default value in case none of them have data. Uh, and then I use the substring plugin here to just give me the first 254 characters of whatever that process plugin returned as a value. Um, and again, this is, the, this is the shared configuration. So you notice I don't actually specify my API credentials in this. Yes? Why would you choose 254 characters instead of 55? That's a very good question. Uh, why do I choose 254 instead of 255? Um, because I like having a little bit of extra padding room. <laughs> um, I've also seen sometimes that people stick in emojis. Um, sometimes UTF-8 encoding on those things tends to take up an extra byte or two here and there, and it really, I get this like question mark inside a diamond at the very end of it. So by stripping it down to a little bit less, it's gonna look bad either way. Like one character for me is not that big a deal, but I found that 255 is cutting it a little close, so I knocked it back one. But that's a good question. And that's something that you have to be worried about too, is the quality of the data coming in. Are people using emojis? In other words, are you importing Instagram or Twitter content? Let's be honest. Um, how are you gonna handle that? Now, thankfully, you know, Drupal 8, the way their data storage is, when you configure uh, a database connection, they're using the UTF-8 four megabyte um, namespace for their collation, which means that you can handle those things. But you gotta worry about if you're truncating things, if you're truncating them correctly and not in the middle of a UTF character. So. Um, be aware if you start getting weird characters showing up, that may be what you're dealing with. This right here is, uh, uh, this is actually still, this is the bottom, the, uh, the end of that shared, uh, shared Facebook group. And you'll notice now we're into things like, these are all field names from the Drupal content, right? Uh, field, social migration, F, publish, status story. Um, You'll notice I'm updated, and this is where I would talk about how to format those dates. Um, thankfully, Facebook uses a reasonable date field. Sometimes our like RSS feeds are just terrible date formats that they come in. Um, so you really have to kind of understand your, your YMD, your, your text date formatting. Um, but the nice thing is, um, as our technology partner at our company has always told us, always store timestamps. You don't have to worry about time zones, you don't have to worry about date formats, you don't have to worry about did, did this person put the day in front of the month or vice versa, is this a European or American style date. Things you don't have to worry about if it's all just a string of numbers of seconds from January 1st, 1960, you don't have to worry about any of it. So as we think about like what are the next steps that we want to take with this kind of a a workflow. 
And this is where the module comes in handy. This is, this is probably what spent the most of my time working on. Are we pulling in more than one Facebook property? So there are modules out there that will allow you to configure one Facebook and one Twitter and one Instagram, which is fine. Sometimes that's all you need. We have clients that only have one account. But like I said, we do a lot of work in the higher ed space. And what we found is that, especially when you're doing a whole university-wide site platform, that you'll have half a dozen departments with half a dozen subdivisions within those departments. And they all have Instagram. And they all want to configure their own thing. And the plugin, uh, the modules that only allow you to configure one Instagram property immediately become useless. Um, if we have a client right now that um, it's one, this is the other thing about higher ed, is everybody's got different names for everything. So I'm probably using the wrong names. They have one college within the university that has half a dozen schools within that college. And each one of those schools has their own set of social media. Some, uh, some of those departments inside, inside those divisions have multiple Instagram accounts just for themselves. Um, I think the last time I did a tally on them, there was 12 separate properties and uh, platforms configured just for that one client. So having the ability to do just one Facebook feed is great, but what if you need a bunch? So this module addresses that question. Um, it might also be helpful, and something that I did here was that I want to store information, especially if I had multiple ones, is to keep track of what migration brought in what account, right? So if I go back to my content list and I got 15,000 Instagram posts, and I have like 10 different Instagram providers configured, how am I going to know which one is which? So I added in a default field, a default value field that basically just says this post was from this migration, this post was from this migration. And you can use that in a view or some other way to filter out uh, where things came from, especially if you're configuring displays based on like what taxonomy is applied to a department page to configure which feeds should show. Um, and then this module, you know, maybe we want to run this on cron so that we don't have to manually update this thing every single time. Um, Maybe we want to allow those site managers or uh, content managers to add or remove migrations on their own without bringing in a developer. Uh, maybe even specify different permission levels so that not everybody can configure this module. And there's a lot of benefits of going this way. Um, you know, I had, uh, we had one project that we're working on where somebody, the contract that, we were, that was doing this said, well, why can't I just use a JavaScript thing to pull this? So, the reasoning for that, um, in no particular order. One of the cool benefits of having it in, a, uh, in Drupal content is that now you get all the benefit of being able to use views or whatever other headless implementation you want to run. Um, and you, know, you, get, uh, you get your caching involved, because now Drupal has all this content. It's displaying it quickly. It's not going out and grabbing something third party. Um, Non-developers can work on things. Uh, content's not going to be re-imported. I mean, if you make changes to these things after they've been imported, if you just want to tweak something after it's coming in, that will stay put even after new content is brought in. Uh, it's fully compatible for folks who use more complex workflows like Workbench, Workbench moderation, um, something like that requires additional permission or review to publish something. This ties in great because it's all just content. One thing I really like is that there's really no third-party dependencies. You're not working on somebody's five-year-old PHP library that has been abandoned, but is the only thing that you could find to work. Um, these are things that are built into Drupal. They're being constantly updated as Drupal makes updates to the API. Uh, and it's 100% compatible with features or config export workflows. And again, just be careful not to store your API credentials um, in, your, in your repo. Last thing I want to throw out here um, is just some further reading information. So there's a link to the Drupal 8 Migrate API docs. There is links to the Migrate Plus and the Migrate Tools. The Migrate Tools really is a companion for Migrate Plus. It allows you to use Drush uh, to work these migrations yourself on the command line. And two excellent blog posts, uh, Migrating XML in Drupal 8 and Stop Waiting for Feeds module, How to Import RSS in Drupal 8. These two. Um, I see a few nods. I, apparently other people have found these posts as well. 
Uh, these two were instrumental in, as I figured this out because at the time there was hardly any documentation. My biggest sources of documentation was literally reading the code to figure out how things worked. Um, these two blog posts were fantastic. They were well written. There's a lot of good examples, but they didn't really speak about what we needed to do for the social side of things. But they definitely helped me understand the Drupal 8 Migrate API and how we could leverage it. And then the last one, I'll just throw out a quick plug. Um, a lot of information about this and some stuff I didn't get into today is on our concepts blog at easternstandard.com. Um, and that's linked there. Uh, the slide deck will be there, the presentation will be there, as well as uh, some of those full size images for um, the work that, some of the things that I showed you that were just way too small to see. Any questions? Uh, can you talk about how, how, how's the performance of the migrate module in, these, in terms of grabbing these feeds? So if I'm only grabbing, let's say, 10 Facebook posts, um, it usually, the first time it runs, it may take 15 seconds to cycle through all that and put it through. Uh, subsequent runs are, especially if they're run pretty consistently, um, subsequent runs, uh, the performance on this is actually pretty fast because, like I said, it's not actually pulling... The majority of the time it takes is actually grabbing the data from Facebook. That's kind of your out of control blocker that you would have in this case. Um, beyond that, once it actually gets the data, it's very fast cycling through the data, figuring out if something's been cached, and if it has been, it just skips over. If it needs to import it, it's, it's a pretty rapid import process. So if you hit a point where it's, it just sort of times out, you know, are you able to sort of dismount from that gracefully, or do you have uh, It depends on how how the um, so how Guzzle works on it. Usually what'll happen is it'll return, say, after a, a timeout, it'll just be just a regular Guzzle error that happens well below the stack of where this module takes place. Um, and all that's handled all the way up through the API, so that by the time you get to the Migrate API itself, uh, it should just say an error like, hey, can't import this. You'll see an error in your log, um, but that's actually, that's fine. It doesn't actually break anything. Um, it's actually good that you, you mentioned that because we do have one client that uh, we had to configure something similar to this for their faculty profiles. Uh, they have a, their own independent database, and we're using their API to pull stuff. And the way that I had to do it oftentimes generates a lot of like 404s because of how it's configured in the Migrate API. And I see a lot of 404 errors in the error log. Uh, nothing I can do about it. We've talked with them about that, and like, yeah, it's just going to happen. But it doesn't actually break the process because the very next time somebody goes to run it, it works just fine. So you'll see an error in the logs, but it won't stop the process from running in the future. Or it won't critically kill it so that it just stays in a stuck state right. for however long it takes you to notice that. Yes, sir. Uh, for the Facebook API calls that you're making, um, <clears throat> what is the controlling factor on how many results you're getting back? Is there, you know, like top 10 most recent posts or something along those lines? So the question was, um, what is the limiting factor on how many Facebook posts should be or can be pulled at a, at a time? And really, that is, a, I think Facebook does have a limit um, as to how many you can pull in a single call. Uh, their API actually allows JSON paging. So they'll tell you that this is page one of five for the results that you want. Like, I want 250 results at a time, which don't do. But if you do, it's like, cool, here's the first 50. I've got the next 50 waiting for you on page two. Now. There is, at this point, a module somewhere in the works with the Migrate API that will actually follow that paging, but it's not ready for prime time yet. Uh, the solution that I've used here is just basically, I will configure how many posts I want to pull in, and that's usually driven by the content that the client wants to see. So if the client only ever wants to see the top five at any given point, I, I might pull 10, maybe. I might just pull six. Because in my view, I'm going to specify, show me the top five posts. Now, when all this data comes in, it's just going to get saved. So after a month of them posting Facebook content, you're going to have 200 nodes of content from Facebook. And it's only, the view is only going to ever limit you to show the top five. But just, just to be sure. You're just, you really are only interested in the most recent posts, right? You're not using some other sorting with Facebook? Not, I'm not doing any sorting outside the most recent thing in this module. Now, the cool thing about this being both open source and configuration based is you can totally modify the URL to sort because it's it's using you're basically making another call to the graph API and saying here's the stuff that I want you can change how any individual configuration is set 
by modifying the URL to sort by something else if you'd like. So uh, by default, it pulls in the most recent top n posts that you specify, but you can totally change that as well. Okay. Yes? Sorry if you answered this, but um, when you make the calls, do they, uh, is it one call and then it's sorted into groups, or each group has their own call? So the question is about uh, how it runs either manually or cron, how it's all grouped together. Um, on the back end, it actually goes through migration by migration. Um, even if you tell it to do the whole, like migrate the whole group, it will still loop through almost like a for each. Let's say grab this first one, grab the second one, grab the third one, because they, they could be completely different URLs. Um, the way it works on the cron is that basically I just queue up everything to run and say like, grab me every feed that my module knows about and then tell the migrate API to do its thing and just pull them in. Um, which is the cool thing about being a plugin-based system is I honestly don't have to care what the migrate API is doing in the background. I just tell it what to do, and I expect that it's going to do what it does the way it does it. I don't have to take care of the implementation of how to grab that content. Yes? So one of the things we've seen across Facebook and some of these is their <coughs> OAuth keys expire and so often can be built in at if it tries to sync and it can't connect properly, we can that key. Uh, it the slay and then, you know, So the question is what happens if somebody gets the key wrong or the key is revoked? Um, and that sounds like a pull request waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Second to that, um, what is your current recommended approach for your system? To run? Um, are using Lysiacron? How often does it run, or does it run on page loop? So, cron, how to configure your cron could be its own separate one hour session. Um, let me just give you a 30 second breakdown of Drupal's cron. The built in Drupal cron, you configure it to run at a certain interval, and the next person that loads your page outside of that interval gets to kick off the cron. On the front end, I don't actually know if that makes the site load any slower. I've not really played with that. But I do know that it happens. You go through your cron logs and see that somebody was ac accessing slash faculty slash whatever, and that's what kicked off cron. That's, that's odd, but that's how Drupal crons work. Drupal's cron works. Um, on platforms like Aqua and Pantheon, they have their own cron job on the system that pings a specific URL to run cron at a more regular interval, so it's less of a poor man's cron in that case. Um, Elysia cron is a module that allows you to get really fine-grained control and hook into the system cron to run some things on a cron and some other things on a different cron. You can set different schedules. It's really pretty powerful. Um, the way I have this module written right now, it really just hooks into Drupal's basic cron. It loads up a cron worker, uh, essentially. Again, Symfony plugins. Um, loads up a cron worker and just sticks it on top of the cron stack. So if you're using Elysia cron, it'll show up as a cronable job there, and you can configure it. If you're not, if you're just using Drupal's poor man's cron, you're fine. It's, it's compatible with both. What is my preferred method? It really depends on the client. Um, if it's a smaller client that doesn't update their social media very often, every three hours is fine. If it's a university that has a lot of things going on that they really want things up to date, I might run Elysia Cron. So it depends on your situation, which one you might go with. But that touches more on what the client is trying to get out of their site. Yes? So. Uh... I assume you have a part of this module that allows, you know, a site builder or somebody to configure like their API keys. And yes. Uh, in fact, let me see if I can uh, find that slide. Oh no, there's no no images there. Um, in terms of, um, you know, when the migrate API, you know, it sounds like it's using a, a YAML file. What's this? How do, how do you con how do you connect the configuration of the module to the what, what Migrate is using, you know, because if Migrate is using a YAML file, right? So is that, is that, is that pulling, is that YAML file pulling data from like configuration setup or how, do, how does that, what's, what connects the dot between the user configuring this to the configuration file that runs the migration? So the secret sauce that combines user configuration into the YAML file is actually on this page here. Um, so this is a, a demo from the Twitter feed this is where all the options for that Twitter feed are, are set up. This is the, the right-hand image on this side. 
Um, and this is a config entity form. So when they save this, they create the system, however Drupal does its own config, it'll actually create a config file. Um, it's actually not entirely true. Um, I actually have to create it manually because Migrate Plus hasn't yet gotten around to writing that config form yet. But this basically creates a config entity and stores it in the back end. So it takes all the values that are configured here, um, bootstraps some other options that are necessary for the single config file, points it at the shared configuration file that was installed when the module was installed, uh, and then saves this as a config YAML file. And the next time you do a config export or you look in your features, it'll show up in there as a config file that you can then manipulate or download or do whatever it is that you do in your workflow. And then the migrate will pull that config file into Correct. Okay. Yeah, so these are, I actually, I, I considered making these a separate entity of a separate class of config entity, but decided that it was actually better just to use the migrate APIs just on its own, um, rather than having to rewrite a bunch of boilerplate code to get it to work correctly with migrate, just use theirs. A little bit of a shortcut, but that's, that's what good programming is, right? A lazy way of getting, hooking things up and making somebody else do the work, so. Anything else? Great, well, um, this is in alpha state right now on Drupal.org. You can download it using your projects. Um, I am actively working on this. We have half a dozen clients that are using this. So I'm making changes somewhat regularly when new requests come in that I think, yeah, that'd be cool. Other people need this. So if you have the time, you want to dig into it a little bit, um, familiarize yourself with the Migrate API, uh, find it on Drupal.org and download it. If you have any questions, pull requests or bug reports, file them there and uh, I'll get to work on them. But this is, uh, this is, our big release, yes. Um, it is, I hope I put it on the last slide. Maybe I didn't. Um, I did not. If you search for uh, social migration is the name of the module. Um, I guess that would be a good thing to include there. Uh, social migration is the name of the module. It's all on Drupal.org. Um, you should be able to find it there. The, uh, the blog post that I have on our Eastern Standard blog does have a link to that as well, so you can find it that way also. And the link to the blog post, and it's a little bit circuitous, is in the slide deck, which you can download from Drupal Camp's website for this topic. All right, well thank you all for coming, I appreciate it. <laughs>